Pressure, 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 pressure. Okay, uh, I do believe we are back. Thank you guys for bearing with me. I just had to knock down the uh, quality of the stream just a smidge to make sure that we are bringing you guys the uh, the show in full tonight. We don't want any buffering. We don't want anything to stop anytime soon. I certainly don't want you guys to miss the broadcast. Um, even though it looks like you might be right now. Why? Okay, no, looks like we're good. Somebody text me, tweet me, make sure I am here. Uh, I'm not even sure if I'm here right now, but I'm hoping I'm here with you guys on your computers. Uh, again, High Red Live is a live weekly web show. Uh, that's what makes it fun and exciting. You guys can tune in and watch me totally just to put my foot in my mouth and talk myself in circles as I try to address technical issues while also hosting my own show on the internet. So, without further ado, again, we are back, we are live, I do believe. Uh, my name is Seth Odell, we're talking about uh, this week on Higher Ed Live, all about looking ahead, predictions for web and marketing in higher ed in 2013. Uh, 2012 was a big year for a lot of people, I know it was for myself, a lot of things going on, but what's happening as we look ahead to 2013? Well, we're going to be talking about two things today. We're talking all about big picture, what's happening to the industry, and we're also talking about ourselves and our institutions. What are we focused on as individuals? And before we tackle that, as always, i just like to say a quick thank you to the sponsors that help make Higher Ed Live possible. We are sponsored by the fine folks at Integral, uh, the creators of the school's app on Facebook, a private Facebook community to boost enrollment and retention. Check out their blog, Integral Insights, for posts on admissions, marketing, student engagement, and social media and higher education. I'm going to be tweeting that link right now, uh, so definitely check it out if you haven't before. They put out a ton of great content, and uh, i got to say, uh, props to them for making sure content is always out there, always free, always easy to read, and they definitely keep the volume up, which as a reader in higher ed, I much appreciate. We are also sponsored by Omni Update. They're the leading web content management system CMS provider for higher education. The company's web CMS, well, it's called OU Campus. It's secure, it's scalable, it's got great tools, features, deployment, flexibility, and on top of all of that, an awesome user community to boot. So in fact, it was even on top of all that, the highest ranked CMS and customer satisfaction, 2010.edu Guru survey. So if you guys need a CMS, find out why they're the best. And uh, I just made that rhyme, and I'm shocked it took me that long to figure out that that rhymed. Because uh, that was pretty exciting. So, thank you guys again for joining us here on Higher Ed Live. As I said, I am Seth Adela. Have not been on the show in a little while. I kind of went away, went to on a trip to uh, Central South America. So, it's been a little bit, which is why I get tech issues. I'm learning how to push the buttons and turn the knobs again. Uh, and I'm going to figure that out on the fly as we bring on tonight's guests as we talk about looking ahead to 2013. First off, let me welcome the one and only Mike Petroff back to Higher Ed Live. I believe record holder for most guest appearances, sir. <laughs> Why don't you just uh, say a quick hello, let people know uh, where you're at, what you do. Uh, hey everybody, uh, good to be back on the show. I, I guess, that I uh, do I have the status of sidekick at this point? I think it's official show? for sure. Uh, so um, I'm, I guess the last time I was on this show, I was working at Emerson College. Now I have a new role at Harvard University. I'm a digital content strategist there behind some of the social media, web, and analytics that we're doing. Very cool. And again, what we're talking about in 2013, it's going to be really cool to see your experience, not just obviously where you're at now at Harvard, but thinking about Emerson too, I think it's going to be a great collection of, uh, of experience for you to share with where institutions should be looking ahead over the next year. Uh, and uh, you are being joined, as am I, by the one and only Mayon Plout, who is also making a, another return. I'm glad that you're becoming a frequent guest, Mayon. Why don't you say hello and introduce yourselves to the fine folks out there in the internet world. Hi, internet world. Um, my name is Mayon Plout. I'm the social media coordinator at Oberlin College. Um, I make sure we look cool online, also in person, also just cool. <laughs> uh, well, you do a fantastic job of that. I, I, I think that you guys are quite cool. Uh, and uh, joining both my own and Mike and myself is the one and only Joel Goodman coming to us from Texas, Austin, Texas. And Joel, give Austin, us a little, Texas. Give us a little bit about your background, too, because I'm excited about tonight is that you can share not only your thoughts as someone who's spent a long time inside companies, but also as someone who's now working outside with a lot of institutions. I think you're going to have your finger on the pulse of a lot of, especially web design, you know, development stuff. I think it's going to be interesting to hear. So uh, say hello. Let us know uh, what you've been up to. Hey, everyone. Uh, since moving to Austin in June, I've been contracting with a, a couple of different institutions and actually a lot of startups here in Austin. But before that, I uh, worked at two different institutions, uh, Trinity International University just north of Chicago and Greenville College just east of St. Louis, uh, where I handled everything from content to web development to design to social media and marketing and you know anything else that has to do with 
the World Wide Web. Awesome. And uh, and speaking of the World Wide Web, that's probably where we're going to start tonight. Uh, just so you guys know, here's how the show's going to work. Like every show, it's the hashtag Higher Ed Live. I got it pulled it up on TweetDeck. I'm sure our guests do too. If you have a question, if you want to take the reins of this show and put it in a new spot, you can do that. This is your show. But in the meantime, we're going to kind of gather our thoughts on 2013 into a few categories, web, marketing, social media, probably analytics, big data, and start with those four and tackle them. But if you want to talk about something else, you just got to let us know, and we will tackle that as as well. Uh, so let's start with web, uh, Joel, since you're up here, I want to bring you on. Uh, for 2013, I'll say, and maybe you could agree with me or not, uh, 2012 was definitely the year that I feel like responsive uh, design kind of got the got the spotlight, and it's been uh, kind of the cool kid at the dance for a little while. Yeah. Um, that's someone who's who works with the web but does not directly work as a developer. I see that as being a big thing. Mobile was huge before that. I think responsive is smarter mobile, but you know, in 2013, where do you see things going, both on the front as far as what schools do, but also since we know the development curve for so many schools is a long timetable, where do you see just the dialogue going with what schools are going to be talking about doing in the future, maybe even beyond 2013, uh, looking ahead? Yeah, sure. I think uh, I think first off, just to, you know, real practical form levels of it, I think we're going to see a lot of content that was originally developed for uh, you know, a traditional desktop browser become a lot more simplified and streamlined so that it's really ubiquitous. And I think that's that's the theme and the trend that I'm seeing going forward. And and I think I think higher ed's gonna start to realize it and start to play with it a little bit this year and then it's going to really come to fruition and, and maturation during uh, 2014 and 15 probably. But really just realizing that the content and the websites and the apps and everything that we do online, no matter what it is, is ubiquitous and has to be ubiquitous. People have to be able to access it and derive the same or uh, a very similar meaning from every form that it takes, no matter where they're at. Um, and, I, and I hope what happens is we get past thinking about the specific devices to just thinking about what the content is itself straight up. Uh, so I, I think I think that'll be a major theme this year, especially coming off of our our uh, kind of binge on uh, mobile being the end all be all. We'll we'll start to see you know what mobile's not just the gate. It might be a quick benchmark, but but we really have to move past that because otherwise we'll be uh, we'll be left behind by a few years once mobile turns into uh, you know I don't know the Google, the Google Glass comes out and, and something like that. And, but. and let me throw out a question, and this is either to you or, or anybody else that gets here. Um, you know, higher ed always has a really broad spectrum of, of um, people being really, some people that are forward thinking, but a lot that are farther behind. Um, in 2013, do any of you want to tell us what is something that's got to be done with the web? Like, if you haven't done this year, it has to be done. I mean, obviously, there's things like mobile sites. I mean, how far, where is the, the bar for where you have to at least be here in 2013? Not even thinking big, huge picture, but what's the, what's the, what's the bare minimum? What's the, what's the standard for where we all should be starting this year right now? Do you want me to, I guess I could try to start and, and yeah, uh, throw in. out something. But, uh, I guess the, if you're at the baseline, I would say 2013, if you're not there already, and it's amazing that I still hear people talking about it, is if your website or department site or something that you're running is not on a CMS where you can structure the content and actually add data to that and move it around on different platforms in an easy way, I'd say that's the place to start and then gradually move um, along the way. I mean, you're never going to hit a point where you're ready for mobile or ready for responsive design if you're not already organized within a CMS and your content actually has some structure to it. I totally agree with that. I think I think Mike's dead on. And and I think even beyond that, I think we should be starting to think um, more about platforms and how we can create a basis for everything that we do going forward instead of having to recreate websites every two years or every one year or recreate anything at all. We should be able to just build upon a, a good solid foundation that we've strategically set out for any project going forward. And CMS is a is a very uh, a very practical expression of, of that sort of process. Uh, now, uh, Joel, you brought up something I want to throw out and, and, and get my on in here too. Talk about is is um that you mentioned it's it's stop not just thinking about kind of mobile or what you're doing, but it's it's thinking a lot more about content and kind of content finally taking the front seat. Um, I will be honest and say this, you know, on the surface, content is not sexy. Content's not going to be voted prom queen or prom king, like the same way that responsive or something that can be keynoted at 100 conferences can. Um, uh, I'll start with you, Mal, but what are, you guys, what are your thoughts on content in 2013 as far as the web is concerned? Because I got to think that that's really the bread and butter that, that should be getting the attention uh, is actually, you know, what you're putting out there and then users' experience with, with the content that you have. 
you just took every word out of my mouth before you started saying the question. I was like, damn it, why did you start talking? Because I was going to say content, but never mind. It's all good. It's, it's fine. Um, I completely agree that content is going to be what happens this year, um, in part just to make sure that we start actually thinking about what we're trying to say, not what officially everyone is trying to say, but like the people who are interacting with us are trying to say to us as well. Um, I think that goes to user experience and to brand management and everything else in between. Um, we're going to have to listen to what's out there, what's being made, and how do we use it best. I, uh, yeah, sorry. Huh? Oh. <laughs> oh, I've been, I'm in full agreement. I think that's definitely going to happen. Uh, I, and I'm excited to see it. Um, moving a little bit more to the marketing realm. Uh, again, we're just going to be throwing a lot of questions tonight. Um, what is, what is a one trend that you guys have that's coming out in 2013? Is something you see changing or happening in marketing? Um, where are we? Because we've heard a lot of buzzwords for a while, but I'm not sure. Uh, I'm entirely sure how much is going to be changing this year from last year. Um, what do you guys see being as a big marketing conversation for the year coming out? It's a big question. Mike, I'm throwing to you first. <laughs> What's, what, what are you uh, looking at going into 2013 as a marketer? I think it's... I mean, this may be a little bit more general than marketing, but just in, in all of the areas that I'm paying attention to, I'm, I'm not specifically in admissions anymore in enrollment, but still trying to pay attention to some of the conversations happening there. It seems like it, there's more of an emphasis on putting stuff out there that's relevant to topical information um, across the web, so rather than what's important at your school, it's like how does our school relate to what's topical around the country? So your, your school might have its five pillars of marketing that it sticks to that says these are the things that we're always going to talk about. Our school is going to be doing this. Um, where what the problem is in the past you know, 10, 15 years that every school is the same five pillars that they're all promoting. So how do you take that and actually make it translate to something that's topical in the world, uh, whether it's online education or whether it's you know, international um, you know, involvement in community efforts, you know, how are you actually pairing that up with a specific example of what you're doing? And I think the schools that are doing that and showing, you know, real world value are the ones that are probably doing the best right now. Yeah, I, I got to jump into too. I think one thing you hit on a little bit is, uh, it, this has been the case for many years, it's just been, you know, timing and relevancy, I think is only become more and more important. People have shorter and shorter attention spans in the web. And it's gonna be more and more about making splashes, uh, even if it's really short. And this is being able to leverage being relevant at a certain period of time and be able to put stories out there and, and manage that I think is really important. Um, to throw out a few that I see, it's kind of interesting. As myself, as you guys know, I'm, I'm more involved in, in television advertising, but I actually see there's going to be an influx, I believe, in nonprofits utilizing television advertising towards the end of this year. Um, in fact, I already know um, eight different universities that are getting ready and are in production to launch new ads that were not running ads last year, and that's just from the count that I've been able to keep internally. So I think there's sort of an interesting trend there. And I actually think there's a bigger conversation about why are schools doing that. And I think there's kind of two. One is that some schools are reevaluating what they're really doing with marketing if it's purely a brand play. And the other is, especially for mid-sized schools or schools that are more competitive, if they're buying locally, the, the big thing I still see happening in 2013 is uh, it's only going to get more and more competitive for students. We're going to continue to see schools that are forced economically, I think, to focus more and more on admissions and enrollment and getting the right students in and keeping the numbers there. Now, it's not the case for all schools of all sizes, obviously, but I think uh, you know, right now in these economic times, we're going to see more and more schools that are facing a situation where they're really maybe having declining numbers or they're facing, if they're public, facing you know, decreased state funding and all of those things, I think, cause like a crunch. And that crunch I've always found at least comes down to marketing and falls down. At UCLA, when we were there, it was the same thing when state funding got cut. It was about, you know, well, who are we? How do we make sure people in the state know we're relevant? For smaller schools, it's about driving, you know, getting students in the door, increasing revenue, filling beds if they've built new dorms. Uh, you know, we have a lot of campuses that have built very large, uh, large establishments on the campus, and they're going to be paying for those for decades. And if they don't have the students, that's a scary thought. Um, I don't see that playing out everywhere, by the way, and I don't think it's going to play out at any of our institutions, for instance, but I do think that we're going to be seeing those stories covered more this year. And I think it's going to raise a question of smart marketing, really, what are we doing? Because maybe I'm alone here, but I think that a lot of branding in higher ed isn't measured. It's kind of just open-ended, and we've just done things because we did it the year before, and I think people are going to have to really start to question as we move ahead further, especially this year, uh, why are we doing what we've been doing for so long? Um, and it'll be interesting to see the answers that they come up with. 
I would love to throw out another thing. I don't know if um, anybody on the back gym or um, the members here have the same experience, but I feel like there's a lot more schools. In we have lost Mike Petrov. He's completely frozen. Uh, let's stand by and see if we can't get him back. Hold on just one second. influential people on Twitter because they would attract them via Twitter and then just because they're uh, joining in the class they're kind of utilizing that influencers network to promote the class itself which is just a really interesting method and I see more and more schools doing that more classes that are becoming popular you know and then you find out oh this this school has that class and by you know I guess the connection or relationship you you have a certain feeling about that school through that and I don't know if other people have seen similar things like that uh, I, I only wish we were so advanced. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jason Wilbur put those a question out that I think is very fair, which is, um, you know, uh, how has any of this changed since 2006? We're having these conversations then. I think there's a, a, a separation in execution where there's a lot of stuff that we weren't talking about in 2006 that we are now on a very tangible execution level. But of course, there's broader issues. Um, and the reality is this is higher education. Like absolutely nothing changes from year to year unless it's based, in my opinion, upon state or federal regulation. Uh, I mean, unless you have something that it's not going to change overnight and, and things simply don't. Uh, this is higher ed. Our industry moves incredibly slowly. But if you look at it, and I think if you look at it with the right eyes, things are absolutely moving and there's absolutely trends to follow. Uh, and they're pretty heavy ones. And uh, I'm very curious to hear what you guys think on more expanding trends. I'm going to ask kind of a loaded big question to them throughout. And I want to talk a little bit about social media. And I'm going to hold my own thoughts on this uh, till the end. But let's go through. I'll start with you, Mayan, and then we'll, we'll go around. Is um, When it comes to social media, here's the things I'm curious about. Uh, what is there anything you're going to be doing different this year? Are there any new platforms you're following or things you're thinking about? I mean, it seems like it's the kind of annoying niche of our industry that's always got buzz terms and buzzwords in it. Um, do we care? Do we not? What's happening? Uh, you are the you are the, definitely the uh, social heavyweight here. So, what are your thoughts in that arena? I have a million thoughts in this arena, but it's going to be narrowed down to this really simple one. This year, I'm not thinking about our platforms anymore. I'm thinking about our audience and what they need most from us in whatever space they happen to inhabit, whether it be in person or online. And then we'll figure out whatever platform needs to be the one that we focus on for that. And I know that like I've talked about and touted that like I've been listening and I've been trying to figure out where all these things are and I've started figuring out where we can do certain things better than others, but every time a change is made, it doesn't help us. And I would rather make stuff that helps us and then helps the network more as a result of that. So every time Facebook will do something different, I will look at it, I will file it away in my brain, but I'm not going to necessarily change everything that we're doing to make Facebook happier. Uh, I, I, I'm fully in agreement. Uh, Joel, what are your thoughts on 2013 with social? Uh, uh, do you see a... I don't know. Well, just in general, I won't even put words in your mouth. Yeah, I mean... I think most, most or at least a good portion of the people that are watching today probably read the blog post I put out a couple of weeks ago um, about how you should never trust a, a public or a, a privately owned corporate platform um, you know, because Facebook's always going to change something and they don't owe you anything because you're not paying them and they actually are making money off of you and Twitter doesn't owe you anything because you're using their service for free and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of that was prompted by the the, the overhyping of misunderstandings about the, the Instagram terms, terms of service changes. But we've seen this for years. I mean, it's been two or three years. And uh, what I hope is that this year um, more institutions will take a cue from my on and what she's doing and not focus on the platform itself, but really focus on how you're actually reaching a person. The, the tool doesn't matter. It's how you're actually reaching your audience and what you're saying and, and whether the quality of that is, is good and, and making an important decision uh, or, you know, making them choose, choose whether or not they, they want to listen to you or go somewhere else. Um, I think I think we can also learn a lot outside of just our higher ed peers. And so, for instance, me being here in Austin and working with a lot of startups and seeing how they approach 
uh, you know, social media and and different things like that. They're they're kind of tying it all together, and a lot of them really uh, realize that um, you can use social media as as the broadcasting tool that it has become. Even though we all talked about how it's not a broadcasting tool for years and years and years, it's still become that, and a lot of us still use it that way. Um, into something that's more participatory media, where you are getting people to actually contribute to what you're doing, and that's through that's through anything. And I know that I know that Mike's done a lot of this in his career, and and a lot of other people in uh, our higher ed circles have done that too. Uh, but there are still a lot of us that sit around and really use it as a uh, means to put out a chunk of you know some kind of like a, a digital soundbite or text bite. Is there a term for that when it's just copy? <laughs> uh, you know, and and that's and that's really not that's not what it's about. Get people to contribute and and give them give them ways to do it because when they take that action, they're buying into what you're doing. And we've heard this. We all know this. Um, I want to come. <laughs> I want to actually happen in 2013. I want us to actually, you know, do do work towards that end and make it happen because it's it's a lot cooler to have people talking with you and around you and and building up that presence for you instead of you kind of dictating it out and hoping someone latches onto it. Absolutely. Mike, uh, what are your thoughts both from your seat now and uh, where you've been in the past? It's, uh, uh, you can be jumping on all sorts of new platforms. Are you shutting down Facebook and moving entirely over to, to the new MySpace? <laughs> uh, I mean, I definitely, uh, my thought is definitely like, um, you know, others have said is keeping an eye on the platforms and seeing what works and what doesn't and paying, paying attention to the changes, not necessarily making our strategy change because of what, you know, their changes, but um, just two things to add to the social conversation. One is, um, you know, we've always had discussion on um, what to do in the background so that we optimize everything properly. Uh, and I think 2013 may be the year that more and more people actually pay attention to that and look at how their content sits on their site and when people do share it and what actually uh, goes out there on Twitter or on Facebook. How does it look? What does it feel like if somebody reshares it? Does it, you know, show up similarly? Um, and then the other piece of that is um, it kind of goes to what Joel was saying before, but it's really just about finding the right person at the right time with the right piece of content. It's about being relevant in that time or place. So uh, when it becomes participatory, I mean, yeah, it's great to get content from others, but another way to look at it too is delivering a piece of content to a specific person at the right time, uh, whether that person is incredibly influential or um, one person that you may you know make a big difference in that person's life and they may have a small uh, community around them I think that's what you can do with social that's different from broadcast it, you know broadcast kind of has one level to it it hits you and then you know it disappears but with social because it's so shareable uh, if you can find that right opportunity to share that right piece of content then your content could go way farther than you could in just one big blast message uh I'm definitely going to echo what you guys say, um, and just for the sake of bold 2013 predictions, um, allow me to to make some further ones on social. Um, I will predict in 2013 um, there will be no new platforms of any relevance to higher ed marketers in any significant way. Um, here, here. There is not even going to be the buzz of a Pinteresty anything. Um, two. Uh, you will get no value out of almost anything you do except from the few main platforms if you engage on them. Um, I see no change in big bursts in other areas, and there's always cases where some institutions have real value with niche communities in certain places, and that's always going to be the case. But I think across the board, there will be nothing new. Uh, it will all stay the same, and it will bring about, I think, a lot of questions in higher ed. I think you will not see institutions hiring social media anymore. I think... Everybody's shown up and hired those social positions within their marketing teams. I don't see them expanding this year, um, and I see them flatlining. And the question I have that I don't know is if there are no new platforms, if there's nothing new and crazy, if we're doing all the same stuff, um, maybe that's fine. Is that okay? I mean, what happens then next? But I predict a very dud, dull of a year when it comes to social media on the surface in higher ed. And, uh, I mean, for myself, for instance, even at the institution that I work at, uh, if it's not Twitter or Facebook, I'm not really on it. And even Twitter, I'm only on it in a customer service way. I'm, I am pulling back a lot our efforts and much more concerning myself with helping people connect with each other and what they're doing and a lot less with, I guess it goes back to this broadcast mentality, but this idea that I need to be everywhere at once talking to everyone. Um, it's much more on a personal level. Uh, I've shared this anecdote before, but you know, on a customer service side, what I what I love at SNU is you know we had an example of a student who complained about a class uh, on Facebook, and within 48 hours, almost entirely within 24 hours, but within 40 hours of the whole thing, we had 
gotten the complaint, looped in our director of student success, looped in the course developer, looped in the faculty member, looped in the advisor, brought it all the way up to the CEO, got the situation addressed, made sure that the student was happy, mailed them out a free t-shirt, uh, and, and made sure that they were happy because it was a mistake on our end regarding the course and the technology issue. Um, that, to me, is what I'm focusing on this year. Uh, is no, I don't want to just be reactive, but to me, that kind of a role, that's the thing that I'm going to measure. I'm going to measure a lot less if I have 8,000 fans on Facebook or 9,000. I'm going to care a whole lot more. What do I do with those fans? So if someone says something and they're upset and they're a human being and they're having a problem, how am I leveraging this platform to be able to hear that and to act upon it? Um, that, to me, is going to be so much more valuable than volume alone and a light engagement like, oh, cool, thanks. I'm looking for... Uh, making sure that those substantial opportunities aren't missed. And speaking of myself, and I'll take this one on the chin, I think I have missed some of those opportunities before where I feel sometimes someone complaining on social media is, oh, we respond and say we're sorry, but I don't really actually go to bat and really try to address something. Now, is that scalable? I don't know, and this is just me. Um, but again, I, I see 2013 as not being a big year for social and higher ed. I see it being a year of reflection, and I think that's a good thing. I think we've been growing so fast I think reflection is good because what we're doing is important. Uh, and just because there's not a cool, new, shiny thing doesn't mean it's a problem. Uh, and I see this as a year of social retrospection. I yeah. actually think that, oh, I'm just going to say something fast. Um, I actually think that's a year of honing rather than just reflection. Because for me, I walked into work on Monday after being off for three weeks, and I looked at everyone and was like, I can catch up with all of this, but I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do with all of it because. No longer is it 100% relevant the way it was the day that it came out. So, again, big picture, but honing in on what is actually important. Yeah, and I've seen this. Yeah, I've seen a trend too of more and more schools scaling back. I mean, it was funny. Like five years ago, you get every conference, and they're like, "How do we get our department on Facebook?" And does our department need a Facebook page if the school has one? Now it's actually reeling back and saying, "Okay, out of all of our, you know, how everything spidered out." Um, how are we actually going to reel it back in and organize this chaos that's out there? So I totally agree with, with Seth's point where you're, you're going to see more and more schools kind of reel back and um, try to make a splash. And the only way that you're going to make a splash is have a coordinated effort across, you know, two or three really large channels and not, you know, two dozen small channels that all are, you know, in chaos. I think we figured out relationships, and I and I hope that's right. Like we've really figured, we've you know we've gone from those those conferences where we were talking about how do we utilize all these tools? Like we got to use all the all the social media, and um, you know, and gotten to a point where we realize that it's really the relationships that are the core of that. And um, and I think I even remember us even talking about that years ago. And you know, I think it's I think maybe we just take a long time to get get it through our heads, you know, from our mouths into our into our fingers or something like that and actually start doing it. But um, I mean, that, that gives me a lot of hope for where, especially like, like marketing through those relationships is going. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, so, and uh, <laughs> there's a couple of people in the back chat. Like Lori saying she just got funding for her first social media intern. Lori, I'm, I'm about to hire a social media manager to work on my interactive team at SNU. So don't worry. It's just not to say that every, and like literally it is just flat. There's still a lot we can and should do, absolutely. I think I'm definitely up in the clouds with these broader predictions, um, but uh, I think it's it's time to simplify. And and uh, another thing came back there that Jason mentioned was, you know, for higher ed because again sometimes we're a little bit slow. He thinks this might be the year for ROI conversations, especially regarding social. And I think that that question brings up a broader issue that I want to talk about, which is everything from analytics to data, um, because there's a lot in that conversation. Because I do think that we're going to keep talking about that. And I wonder what should we be talking about as it relates to analytics, data, ROI, and what will we actually be talking about and doing? Um, so it's kind of a big, broad topic. So let me start on a more personal level. For any of uh, you guys, what do you see on a personal level you see as being something that you might look at either for yourselves or in Joel's case if you're working with it with an institution? But like on a personal level, what would you, uh, how would you approach ROI, big data, analytics, anything in that realm this year in 2013? Uh, let's start with what we should be doing, and then talk about if, if we think the industry is going to really be following in in that light. Mike, I want to start with you. What, how do you see analytics playing into your role in 2013, and do you see it being any different than than 2012, or is it just kind of just uh, more of uh, what you've been doing in the past? Well, a lot of in my position right now, a lot of it is just awareness because you know I'm working now in a brand where there's a lot of mentions and 
Um, sometimes it's tough to distinguish what's important and what's not important uh, because everything sort of sits at a flat level on something like Twitter, where on Facebook, Facebook determines what's important at that point. It's going to raise that kind of stuff up. Um, I think 2013 is going to be a year where um, hopefully we get to a point where we find out, you know, in general across all colleges is um, what mentions actually have weight and what mentions um, can pass by. Because I think, like, the scale that things are running at, um, like you said, with customer service, it gets pretty difficult. Unless you have two or three people working behind the scenes 24 hours a day, you can't, you know, keep up with that scale. So when it comes to looking at data, I think it's really going to come to a point where um, you're going to find out how to quickly look at um, a broad swipe of all of the data coming in and um, really target what's important and what to focus on and um, possibly what you can ignore. And then that kind of stuff could bubble up in, you know, you have your daily and weekly and monthly reports that you send out where everybody tends to look at the same kind of billboard numbers, which is how, you know, what's our total follower count, what's this, what's that. Um, when you can start targeting some of those really important numbers and pairing them up with goals of the institution, whether it's, you know, increasing customer service efforts or, you know, getting more people to sign up for events, you can actually pair up the social numbers with um, the outcomes and the goals. Yeah, absolutely love it. Uh, and I think that's a really good point. Um, looking a bit further in the big data conversation, I don't know. I'm so on the fence with where I think this is really going to go. Um, I don't think I think big data is just going to continue to be a bit of a buzzword in higher ed, and it goes to a, a, a piece of what you said, which is I'm just not sure how this data is going to be used. Um, uh, you know, I think there are smart institutions out there, but I think there's many that will be pulling reports or doing things and then not changing much. And the reason I say this is because I don't see why, like again, I keep using the term big data, and I actually hate that term, so I'll just use data. Uh, I can't see why data has to start with marketing or analytics or web analytics or, or anything else, I don't see why it can't start with what we already do. And I think there's a, a, an army of schools that do a very par, poor job utilizing data to actually understand student success, how they're performing in their courses, uh, everything from course load to just the actual admissions funnel. Like I, I think that there's a lot we fundamentally don't do well as an industry with data as it is. Uh, so I'm not so sure it, it, why would it change on the front end if it doesn't on the back, I guess might be my, my broader question. Um, you know, and, and again, maybe I'm wrong. I hope I am. Uh, but at the same time, I think it just really is going to come. I think data and higher ed is going to come down to the individual. It's going to come down to the, the one or two people in an office that say, we're going to track certain things and then make smarter decisions with it or utilize it to make an argument. I don't see data being the kind of thing that has a sweeping impact on any institution, uh, on, except in a handful of cases where you might have a, a president or a chancellor or someone who's really, really focused. I, I still see it being that kind of isolated silo thing. Um, yeah, you can track all the numbers if you want, but unless you're making smarter decisions with them, I don't know. So um, maybe I'm wrong. My honor told, sit, pull me back from the edge here. Tell me about why you can make really smart decisions with data and you're going to do all these awesome things in 2013 and why I'm just super a curmudgeon dude uh, here at the beginning of 2013. Pull me back from the ledge, please. Someone, anyone, Bueller. I'm not going to pull him back, my on. Do you want to? I I'm, I'm don't just know how to pull you back. About this. <laughs> So my, I my, agree. Yeah, my, like the problem is I agree, but I think that there's potential that is going to start being tapped slowly. <laughs> so like this year isn't going to be the year of big data. It might be the like beginning of tiny datas. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, so, and a lot of what we've been trying to do, if you think about your your job and the value of your job for the past you know five years, if you work in a web strategy or digital strategy or social media role, is trying to prove your worth, right? So it's that idea that, you know, I, you know, this is why social media is important. And you're sending directors and everyone, every stat that says, you know, why more and more students are using Facebook now. Now they're all jumping on Twitter and Instagram and why we need to be there and this and that. Um, that's great, but it's basically now common knowledge. So you can't rely on that kind of data anymore within your job. The data that you need to rely on is the, you know, how does this effort pair with this institutional goal or outcome? And I know Seth's been doing a lot of that stuff that we've been talking about, too, is that, you know, what, what's the ultimate outcome? It's not that you're getting more mentions on Twitter. It's the fact that you're driving more awareness for a piece of research which, you know, may not have had, you know, seen the light of day unless you had enough conversation going about it that the right person saw it at the right time and now they're talking about it. So um, I feel like that's the kind of data that we're talking about. It's not the general, you know, social media proves its worth, it's the more, you know, how am I using social to actually get to an end goal? Yeah. And it, it's, it's tougher. I mean, it is really tough to set up that kind of stuff. Talk to how many people that, you know, know how to use goals and analytics and, 
there's not a lot of people that actually follow it through. They may have set one up and they never go back to it, pay attention. So uh, goals, funnels, that kind of stuff, and looking at campaign tagging and saying how do the two relate, I think that's the easiest way to get started. And, and, I, and I, I mean, I, to be cynical with you, Seth, I, I think a part of the practical reality of it is that a lot of these institutions don't have the staffing or don't have people that feel competent enough to look at data and pull out insights at all. And so until there is an institutional-wide focus on using, you know, whatever pieces of information that you can get from anywhere, I mean, whether that's capturing, uh, you know, admissions uh, information in your CRM or, you know, whatever you put into your ERP across campus and just figuring out what your students are actually doing on campus and things like that, um, you know, I, I, I think that it can feel like a waste of time, and I think it probably is a waste of time until you actually have, until you can actually do something with it. I mean, it, it's it's good for it's good for people to to you know start playing with it, but I think that in order to make data actually work for you, you need people that mm -hmm. know how to understand it and extrapolate out from that and actually use it in ways that make sense. And and, and just to to jump on that even a bit further, because I, I talk a lot about data at SNHU a lot. Um, I, I don't want to act like that's my numbers and I'm really great at data because it's important to talk about that. I mean, at SNU is the only institution I know of that has a centralized data team. And we actually have 12 members on it now. Uh, so we have 12 people that only work doing data and they work and every other part of the institution is sort of like a client to them. And our CEO can ask for reports and work with them and say, I want to find out what's going on to the point that we can not only find out where the, where the pain point is in a certain class or with which classes, but within that class, where within what weeks, what assignments, what went wrong, if it's faculty member. But this is all because we've centralized that approach. And I don't see other institutions doing that. And that, again, because what we said, it puts the burden on an individual. So yes, as my aunt said on the back channel, even, you know, if we can do tiny data as an individual, I think there's a real, that's where data makes sense, where rubber meets the road, is just don't think about the institution, but yourself and what you do and what your goals already are, and just how can you measure if you're reaching your goals as it is. Uh, and, and, and this big picture stuff is great, uh, but unless you have a whole army of people willing to do it with you, your head might be a little bit in the clouds. So I don't see what's wrong with just saying, you know, I'm making decisions today. How are they working out? Are they working out well or not? And how can I make them better? And, and just starting with ourselves. I think that so many times the data conversation is a lot bigger. Um, and that's great. And it's it's perfect. But I, I got to think where I work is definitely not the norm. And it's the exception. And I don't think you need to wait around until you hire 10 people to to. Do it in a way that makes sense, but I don't think it's going to be as big as people think, and, and that it never changes. It, I don't think it ever is. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of this conversation about um, things kind of just being sort of straight. I, I am a believer that 2013 is just going to be pretty flat line. There's two other predictions I'm going to make. I'll make one big prediction, and this is my last, like, grumpy Gus prediction of 2013. <laughs> Um, which is just that I, I think we're going to see a continued exodus of young talent, which we continue to see. And I think we're going to continue to see people that, that begin, at least younger professionals, younger in quotes, I think people that uh, are, or people that are just very active in general of any age, um, that are kind of the go above and beyond, people that are actively generally blogging, going to conferences, tweeting, doing this stuff. I, I see a serious burnout this year. Um, I see people pulling back. And I actually think that's a really good thing. I don't think we need to all be out there trying to champion the industry all the time. I think sometimes we can just try to do our own jobs better and help our own institutions better. But speaking purely from my own perspective, I, I see it being a year where we take a step back. Um, uh, it's weird to say that too, because that's something that has changed. I mean, talk about the buzz from 2008, 9, 10, 11, like even going up to 11, there was this huge, you know, everybody wanted to be out there talking about all this stuff. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I don't see the conversations having the same volume or vigor that they once did. Am I right or am I wrong, panel? What do you guys think? I'm actually some of that young talent that fled, and uh, and you know, just just for me, it wasn't that I didn't. It's not that I don't like higher ed because I love higher ed, and thus I'm still on the show and working with a bunch of institutions. Uh, but I mean, what it really came down to was I, I was I was tired of the barriers that were there, and I I think that. I think that it, it is going to cause a refresh, maybe some kind of a, uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll energize, you know, even like, even though you're getting the, the young talent that's supposed to have all the big ideas or whatever, you know, even though they're, even though they flee, I, I hope that a lot of them are like me and really do want to uh, stay connected and stay working in the field and, and it's for reasons other than, you know, not liking the work. Um, and I think that that energy, especially, you know, I, I find myself energized. I find myself having uh, better ideas when I approach projects with different uh, colleges and universities. Um, 
because I'm spending a lot of time with people outside of higher ed while working with those because there's a lot that higher ed and this has always been true even since I started you know working uh, in higher ed web at, in 2007 it's always been true that there's tons that we can learn from outside tech and people that are doing uh, businesses outside of us because they all relate and I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's important that we keep that kind of an eye on it um, I think that to stop the exodus there would have to be some very fundamental structural <laughs> changes in how uh, many colleges and universities operate uh, I think it's I think a lot of its politics people are tired of having to fight I was tired of having to fight to do cool things and uh, now I don't have to because people hire me and they have to fight and then I get still too cool things. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would echo that point on just getting outside of higher ed for conferences. Um, just a, a quick example, I went to a local Boston area analytics conference that, um, you know, I'm just trying to, to add more and more knowledge to what I can do with analytics and what uh, people attach value to uh, when it comes to the reporting and stuff. And I, I went to that conference and I was blown away. I was just like, man, I, I, there's so much more that I have to pick up and learn. And, you know, I feel like I'm at... Um, a good point within the industry, but then I see what's happening outside of the industry and what's going on, where the trends are going. I can see higher ed taking five years to try to catch up to that kind of stuff. So um, I would I would encourage people to, to just be, you know, look outside of what's being written about higher ed and maybe look at what's being written about in, um, you know, digital strategy in general or analytics in general and try to um, see if some of those um, ideas can translate to what you're currently doing at work. Uh, I you know I love it and and I got I, I gotta uh, agree with that I think stepping out uh, and seeing conversations elsewhere really makes sense. Um, I have one last overview and then I'm gonna talk to, uh, dive into a little bit more specific things. But um, just some industry trends. I don't think anybody's gonna disagree with in 2013. Uh, I think there's gonna be a real again this is kind of my world but a real expansion in online education. Folks are gonna be really doing a land grab to try and get in there especially institutions that are facing budget issues and are looking for a new revenue stream. Uh, it's out there. There's room in the market. The for-profits are crumbling under federal regulation and, and, and absolutely plummeting in on themselves. Uh, the for-profits will die, not for 10 years, though, not in 2013. Um, uh, but we are definitely seeing trends there. Uh, the only thing is you're going to continue to see annoying BS buzz in the online space as people don't know what to do. Uh, MOOCs are going to continue flying high, I think, all the way through 2013. It won't be until the end of 2013 that people start to have more concrete conversations about why are we giving away all this stuff when nobody's really using it and it's not helping the business so there's no way to monetize it. You're hearing that conversation now but not on an administrative level because a whole lot of schools are still jumping in the bandwagon. So I think it's going to be really towards the end of the year that we see schools getting smart with online and maybe they're figuring out a way to tie these kind of buzz-worthy uh, educational tools into something that has a broader impact. Um, but I think that's going to take the whole year to happen. Uh, but I see all of us getting annoyed with that kind of dialogue within about six months. I know I'm there already. Uh, and finally, um, the flattening of higher education will not happen. And we won't get any closer except about this much. Tuition will be raised at, I would predict, all but, all but 20 institutions. Ready for this, guys? This is what this is all about. Uh, in 2013, all but, I'll be safe, all but 30 institutions in the United States of America will increase tuition. Uh, less than 30 institutions in the United States will either uh, hold tuition or potentially decrease it. And I bet it would be less than five that even decrease it, maybe 10. Uh, so 30 institutions don't raise tuition in 2013. Uh, all the rest will. That's my prediction. Uh, and uh, students will pay it. Uh, and nothing will change. Uh, the flattening of higher ed uh, is the slowest deflating balloon you've ever seen. It's going to take decades. Uh, there is change. Glaciers do melt. Um, but I wouldn't be worrying right this second about any of that happening. Um, any of those big, bold predictions any of you guys want to weigh in on before I move on to the next subject? I, I, think, I think on the topic of, of online uh, education, I, I think that 2013 could potentially be a pretty big watershed for a lot of those uh, institutions that have not implemented any kind of online education um, and, and feel the need to. I, I think there are some, I mean, there are some schools that don't need to even worry about that at all. I mean, it's just not their market. But those that are feeling the real press because they've placed all of their uh, effort on traditional residential campuses and aren't able to uh, continue to keep that up and actually maintain the, the income that they need from that, uh, they're going to be faced with a decision whether to go really small or to 
uh, and I've seen this at other places, you know, pay a whole lot of money to someone to outsource their, their online education because they're going to have to try and do it in a year. And either way, they're going to have to hire a ton of staff or they're going to have to outsource it somehow. And the outsourcing thing is hit or miss, um, and I've seen it fail miserably, and I've seen it be okay but not awesome. And uh, I, I, I really think that this could be a decider of whether some schools stay open and, and continue to operate under their missions because, uh, you know, at some point you, you, can't, you can't wait. <laughs> I mean, how long has online uh, education course been going on? I mean, I, when I was doing my master's at the new school, they said that they started theirs in, like, 1996 or something yeah, like that. Uh, so, SNHU was 95, same thing. Yeah, it's been a yeah. long time. So, it was called know, distance learning back then. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so something. I mean, I think I think something has to break at some point, and I think 2013 is as good a Actually, year as any. You know to what? See that happen. So I got to jump in on that. Uh, 2013 is the final year that there is a nail in the coffin uh, for the uh, uncomfortability around online education. I predict at least one of the major Ivies will make a major play in online and bring credibility as a household name. It's already credible, as we all know, as an industry now. The for-profits are shrinking. They've been under federal regulation for years now. Um, for us inside, we know it's a viable business model. There's revenue streams in that it works and can provide a high-quality education. But this 2013 is the year that a major name makes a major play, and finally the entire country understands, and it becomes a household thing. Um, that's a good thing to predict, because I'm jumping at you I think this, there's going to be a big play from somebody big this year. And I think people are going to notice. Um, I see that. So, guys, my, my two things I want to talk about then is, uh, you know, I've talked a lot about I think there's going to be kind of a flatlining and kind of just uh, 2013 is just going to be 2013. Uh, just like my, you know, eighth grade for me was just kind of eighth grade. Like seventh grade was kind of cool. Ninth grade I was like, but eighth grade, ah, I just kind of right through. So that's going to be 2013, I think. But broader than that then, I want to share uh, two things. Uh, every time I start a year, I always come up with a different slogan, uh, and I utilize that slogan for myself both personally and professionally. Uh, a few years ago, it was, I think it was, what, 2011 to the face, uh, and, uh, and then another one was like 2009 coming at you, things like that. So I have two slogans for 2013, and I'm curious if my panelists do as well or not, or just in general how these reflect. The first one is the simplest, which is uh, 2013 back to basics. Uh, for me, I'm just going to try to look at what I'm doing and do it better uh, and be the best that I can at what I do. So and when it comes to higher ed, you know, I'm just looking at what am I trying to do and how can I do it better. It's just really simplifying the questions uh, and just working really hard. And instead of trying to do a lot of things and be ever at once, I want to do the things I'm doing really, really well. Um, so 2013, back to basics. But let's think about that. So if we're, we, we don't have to have our heads out in the clouds and be chasing down every blog article and trying every new platform. And we're just focusing. What does that mean? Well, it means in 2013, this is where it gets exciting. I think we can do awesome things. 2013, do awesome things. I don't think it's about what platform anymore or how you're measuring it or exactly the way people get to it. It's like, what is it? It's what's the it factor of 2013. I think you can do cool shit. Uh, you know, last year I had a chance to do only a few really, really cool projects with work um, that were really exciting. We just do a random one. We put an Easter egg on our homepage for the Contra anniversary. So if you typed up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA on our homepage, it let you illegally play Contra inside this new site. Um, that was awesome. Uh, I, you know, I want to do more things like that. It's less about the platform or anything else or how you mentioned. I just think that we have a chance to do really awesome things because we're kind of focusing. So it's all about the big ideas, um, uh, the big ideas that are totally um, different or original, as original as any idea can actually be anymore. Um, but that's it. So 2013 is back to basics so you can do awesome things. That's my takeaway in 2013. Um, so uh, Mayon, let's go to you first. 2013, what's your takeaway? Do you got a slogan? What are you thinking uh, for 2013? Uh, are you going to be doing awesome things? Uh, I should hope that I'm going to be doing awesome things. It's kind of my plan for everything, not just 2013. But my mantra for the year is be a human. And I know that seems like a giant cop out, but it's been the most valuable thing that I started doing kind of by accident. And at this point, it's just straight out there that is all that I am focusing on for everything that I'm doing personally, professionally, whatever. I like it. Uh, Joel, 2013. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I got tons of slogans. Uh, one of them is do cool things, which is very similar to the do awesome things. Uh, and the other one for me is hustle is hope. I just want to keep working hard to do those cool things and, and actually make them happen. And there are a lot of cool things that I have planned for this year, and uh, hopefully everyone will see them, and I, I hope that a lot of them benefit uh, you know, what, what my, my friends and colleagues that are working at universities and colleges do every day, and I hope they do cool things too. Mike, what are you thinking? Uh, I guess an easy one to sum it up, uh, which is kind of based on some of the frustration that everybody seems to feel and everybody likes to talk but doesn't have time to get things done or has, you know, things in their way or everything. But um, mine is just get it done. Like, it's it's that idea that, you know, if there's something in front of you, you know, you need to do it, then just do it. Um, usually feel better on the other side, even if it takes an extra 10 hours to try to finish. But um, I feel like this is the year that, you know, there's there's enough tools, there's enough resources, there's enough people to help you. Everything's there. It's not new anymore. It's not, you know, uh, I don't know how to do responsive design. There's a thousand things that you can read online to pick it up in a weekend if you need to figure it out. But um, this is the year that people just actually get it done. I love it. And and I'll just add to the one other thing that I've been thinking about for 2013. And again, this is probably, pro probably more personal, but it actually is professional too. It's just talking about decreasing the volume and centralizing it and talking more about depth. Um, is it about how many relationships we have or how powerful they are? And I, I, that's something that, you know, when we invest our time and our energy, that shows our true commitments. Um, not what we say, um, but what we do. And to me, it's so much, in, that's so important that uh, I spend the time, both personally and professionally, focusing on relationships that are valuable and investing in them as individuals. It's still so easy on a personal level to broadcast and consider sharing uh, as something that's building a relationship, but it's really not a lot of the time if it's just outbound sharing and you're not really listening. And I think that, that this goes even professionally, though, as well. I mean, even just at SNU, we've started building you know, a little social CRM where we're tracking students on Twitter. And we only have about 25 of them right now that I know – where they are in their programs and the classes they're taking, and we proactively reach out and we tweet with them. And I ask, like, hey, how's your classes going? You know, I know you have midterm coming up next week or you have a big paper due this week. And I know I can't do that with all 20,000 of our students, but to have that level of a relationship where we're, I'm proactively reaching out from a university account to a student and, and, and actually knowing what they're doing, um, I think there's something about the depth of that kind of a relationship uh, that's that's pretty cool. And again, on a personal level, I think especially in life, it's, it's not just about uh, having a relationship with everybody, but it's about making sure that the relationships that are most important have real uh, depth and are, are rich. And again, you we our investments and uh, our priorities are shown through our, our actions and our mouths. So it's really about how do we spend our time. And if we spend our time on the things that we, we spend our time on the things that we care about, whether we admit them to ourselves or not. 2013 is the year to recognize that and invest in the things you really want to invest in. And that's, as always, humans. Mayon, you have done it. You get the golden egg for 2013. You have hit it on the head. It's about people and giving a shit and cool stuff and being awesome. And that's – it's hunky-dory. It is again. Look at this. Grumpy Gus is gone, and uh, I have melted away, and I'm back. I, I think it's about those those moments with people, um, and I think that's, that's really uh, pretty awesome. And I think – that there's some of those moments that are intangible. We just actually just yesterday I got a, a direct message on our new Twitter account from a student we've been back and forth with saying uh, he just said let me try to figure out paraphrase as best I can. He basically said you know you know I, I told my children I would try but I wasn't sure I could do it and to know that I can and I'm not alone and he said you know it's meant a lot to me because because we've been reaching out because and asking how it's going um, you know that's worth it uh, and that's awesome and maybe that doesn't scale. Um, but it still kicks ass, and I like it because uh, humans are cool. So that is 2013. My panelists and friends, are there any final thoughts, parting words of wisdom you would like to share with the world of higher education before they get going on, on 2013? Because let's be honest, guys, none of us thought we'd be here. We thought 2012 was it. We didn't plan, and now all of our <laughs> pants are collectively down, and we're trying to figure it out pretty fast. Um. Based on an article I read this morning that reaffirmed a lot of things I've been thinking about this past year in particular, based on the fact that I live on the internet and I also live as a person in the world, um, that the world is actually just the world. It really doesn't matter where it is. So I'm, I don't know, I want to keep that one in mind too. It's not really like a motto for the year, but it's just a reminder. 
I love it. Mylon, you've, you've, you've stolen the show again. Um, <laughs> and with that, uh, allow me to say once I'm Mike, why don't we just say, uh, I'll let you guys all do a little sign off and goodbye. And then we'll, we'll wrap the uh, first show of 2013 up for higher ed live. Michael Petroff. I can't marry you again. That was only a little <laughs> once in 2012. Not everybody knows. I, I, uh, I officiated Mike's wedding. Uh, and, and did an awesome job at that, uh, <laughs> new LinkedIn profile button. But, uh, thank you, man, for coming on the show tonight and, and hanging out. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, that reminds me, I have to give you an endorsement on LinkedIn for marrying people. But, um, yeah, I just, uh, to sign off and, and good luck in 2013 and this community in higher ed, um, is pretty, it's a pretty awesome community. I mean, they never seem to amaze, um, what I'm doing and w what I feel about what the work that we're trying to um, figure out and accomplish and then talk about after we do it. So, um, you know, I've, I've tried to keep community going in some of the projects that I've been doing, but it's gone way past that. And it's, it's pretty cool to see how um, everybody's connecting and everybody's talking about what they're doing now. I absolutely agree, man. And thank you for your work with, with everything from follow EDU and EDU tweet up something else to bring everybody together. I mean, it's been a real value to the industry. Uh, cool. And it's been great. Uh, Mayon, sign off. I mean, you already said all your words of wisdom, so I don't know if you just want to wave because you've kind of already crushed, crushed the closeout. So maybe that's 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 all you need to do. <laughs> I think the only final thing is I'm really incredibly disappointed that I've only face to faced like at the same table as Joel. And I would like to change <laughs> that in this coming year. <laughs> yeah, I agree. There's definitely a bucket list of of higher ed people that I, I still have yet to meet, and that needs to change. Um, for sure. So, uh, but the world is the world. So actually, we have met. It's just the. It is, and the thing is, we're humans, and that's what this year is all about. I need to say nothing else. <laughs> Thank you for coming on, and Joel from uh, from down south. Yeah, uh, really excited to still be working in higher ed. Uh, one thing that I said in my higher ed web presentation that. Um, I just want to encourage everyone with is if you have a cool idea this year, follow it out. I mean, if you think it's cool, don't doubt yourself. Just try it and, you know, get the buy-in you need to or just try it on your own and see if you can do something cool with it. Um, and come visit me in Austin. Love it. Uh, first of all, I'm doing that for sure. Uh, and thank you guys for coming on. And thank you guys for watching uh, my first show of 2013. Uh, looking forward, predicting web and marketing trends for 2013. This has been Higher Ed Live. Thank you guys for joining, and thank you guys for being part of the back channel. It's a great back channel tonight. Great dialogue. Appreciate the guests coming on. Appreciate everybody being a part of it. Um, it's really cool. I think you're all awesome, and it's really nice to have you in my life and to be able to talk about this kind of stuff and have these kind of conversations. I think it's valuable, and you guys put up with all my ramblings, and my only hope is that one of you wrote down all my ridiculous predictions and can throw them back in my face next year, uh, and I think that should happen because um, I just think it should. Uh, so with that, guys, thank you for being a part of High Red Live. As always, this in every single episode is archived at High Red Live. Uh, I believe this is episode 103 for me, so broke the three-figure mark. Uh, and I hope you guys have a great year. Uh, be awesome to each other. <laughs>